So welcome to the Education Power Panel. We are here to discuss education and things that pertain to students, educators, and parents and families to help prepare everyone. At this time, Mar Maria Jasanya is gonna take us further. Hello? No, I don't think it's on. It's on. Praise him. Mm -hmm. It's on. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Jasanya. Um, a little bit about myself, I am a nurse, but I also like to call myself a nurse educator. So I'm very big on nursing. I'm actually an adjunct professor currently at Hunter College, mm -hmm. where I teach nursing students. So education is something that I'm very passionate about. I feel especially for us as minorities, that's really the only way for us to get out of poverty. So it's very important that you continue to seek even higher education and certificates. So we're going to introduce our panelists. So we'll start from Sister Vanjie. Okay. You can tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Vangela Curtin, and I'm a retired elementary school principal. Elementary school runs from pre-K to five. Um, and I worked in the Department of Education for 34 years. Mm -hmm. I started as a teacher at one school. In that same school, I became the assistant principal. In that same school, I then became the principal. Um, so I spent most of my tenure at one school, PS 268, District 18 in Brooklyn, New York. Good evening. My name is Sean Blanks. Um, for 11 years, I taught middle school math right here in Brownsville at IS392. I have three students that are members of this church, um, Gregory, um, Morgan, and Tasha. They all were my students. Um, this year, um, um, in March, I actually left the classroom to become the program coordinator for a joint program with the United Federation of Teachers and the Department of Education, which I know you guys have a flyer. We'll talk more about it later, but I'm the program coordinator for the Dollar Teacher Program, which is a free homework help hotline, which we provide um, Monday through Thursday from 4 to 7. So any kids having problems with homework, you can call and receive free instruction um, over the phone with your homework. And we take calls from not only New York City public school students, but charter schools, even from all over the country, we provide this um, homework help. So, um, yeah, that's about it for now. All right, thank you so much. Hello, I'm Pamela Ledbetter, and I've been teaching for 16 years in an elementary school. I have a master's in elementary education, and um, I'm here for any questions or any information you need. <laughs> thank you so much. Good evening, I'm Michelle Ware. I am a school counselor at PS 161 Elementary School, the Crown School, located in Crown Heights. I am also a school counselor at a YABC program, which YABC stands for um, Young Adult Borough Center. And with that program, we help high school students who are not doing well in their home school to transition over to our program so that they are able to accumulate and earn their credits that they need to graduate. Thank you so much. So the first question, this is both for Sister Vanjie and Sister Michelle. What advice do you have for parents and students in regards to choosing a school? You can begin first. Okay, I'm going to discuss that with the Department of Education, um, you're normally, are usually placed in the school that you're zoned for. They have an enrollment office that's in each borough. If you have a situation where you're in a neighborhood and you're not, you're not happy with your community school, you don't want your child to go to that particular school, you would have to go to the enrollment office to find out what you can do. The policy is that wherever you live, that's where your child should go at the zoned school. Now that has advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. The um, advantage is that if, you in a, if you're in a neighborhood and you're vested in that neighborhood and you're not happy with your community school, the only way it's going to get better is if you get involved as the parent. And as parents come together effectively to make change in the school, go into PTA meetings. Oh, we'll, we'll talk a little okay, bit about okay, that. Okay, okay, <laughs> I won't go ahead of myself, but you have to be the voice to make a change. Um, so. If you leave the neighborhood and you go and everybody flee from your neighborhood, then your schools are not going to get any better. 
And so then you're not helping the neighborhood grow. I know that as a parent, we have choices. Parents, if you have the finances, you can have parochial school, you have private school, and now they have charter schools. It's been in existence now for almost about maybe eight years, maybe that long. Charter schools. It's your choice to put your child in a charter school, but once again, I'm pro-community school, okay? That's most of us sitting here went to a community public school, and we have nurses here, we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have entrepreneurs, we have teachers. So the schools are good. When you pull out of your community school and you go to a charter school, what you do is you take funds from that community school. And then you wonder why they're not succeeding. They're not succeeding because they don't have the children. That's what happened to my school. Charter school opened up on Rockaway Parkway. They came in because parents, as parents, and I'm a parent, when you hear brand new, tickle your ears, it sounds good. I want my child out of school and they have to have a voucher. It's you have to go through a lot of things to get into charter school. So they make it appealing to you. But just like there are failing community schools, there are failing charter schools. There are good community schools, there are good charter schools. Good and bad and wherever, you have to be the one to be invested in your community school. Because when you take the children out of school, you take the funds. And when there's no money, there's no budget, then we can't do the things that we, can, we need to do to make our schools better. So generally, it's zoned. If you're zoned in an area, that school in that area, that's the school that you're supposed to go to. All right, you thank you. Um, you, Sister Michelle, you, if you have a, um, anything you want to address in regards to that question, or you can further discuss what is the difference between a private, a public, and a charter school. If you know, if not, you can just answer the <laughs> first question. Okay, um, to prepare your child for school, I would say that you need to have your children read, 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 and read some more. <laughs> because, especially in the summertime, because when they come back from summer break, they, they fall behind a little bit. So it's very important in the summertime that you have your child engage in some type of academic curriculum, some type of academic something. Rather, mm -hmm. if they're at home, they need to read a book at least once a day for at least 30 minutes, depending on how old they are. If the older, more time, at least an hour. Um, have them read a book that they would enjoy. Um, another thing that I would touch base on is to talk to your children about behavior. It's very important that they behave themselves in school. Um, no bullying. Well, no uh, we're going to talk about that in right. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to touch um, behavior is very important. Um, as far as I would say, and also for teachers, because if they're not behaving in the classroom, it's difficult for the teachers to teach. Okay, well, we'll continue with you, Sister Michelle, since you, talked, uh, you touched on it already. Please discuss ways to prevent and resolve conflict between students and conflict between students and teachers. Okay, I'll touch on students to students. Okay. Um, I think Sister Van might be better equipped to mm -hmm. touch on students to teacher okay great because me dealing with teachers it's a little bit more touchy because they're my colleague mm -hmm. um but student to student um i would suggest that you talk to your children mm -hmm. yes you are the parent but i'm also asking that you become your child's friend i'm not saying you have to be all buddy buddy and do everything your child wants no because you still have to have some type of discipline but I do believe if you have that close, connect friendship with your child, your child will be able to come to you and tell you anything that is going on and feel comfortable coming to you and tell you everything that is going on in school. So as far as teach, um, student to student conflict, how I deal with it in my building in elementary is I talk to each student separately for a period of time, and then I have them come together and try to do peer mediation. Can you further discuss a little bit about what peer mediation is? Peer mediation is um, when, two, when you have two students come in and they discuss how they're feeling about each other. 
and what conflicts that they may have that they need to resolve. All right, thank you. And Sister Vanji, do you want to talk about how to prevent conflicts between students and teachers? First of all, it, it definitely starts at home in setting the boundaries for respect. They have to respect the adults in the building, okay? And the Bible says, uh, you know, respect, honor your mother and your father, your days will be long upon the land. Not just mother and father, natural mother and father, in sense means those that have authority over you. Right. So, and you have to be careful how you talk. You might not care for the teacher, something might have, may have happened, you have to be very careful how you speak around your children about the teacher and what you say in front of the child because then you break down the walls of respect. So you always want to keep a level of respect um, that they know because she mentioned something about parents, we are their parents when you're away. It's in the law of education, it's called parente locos and it's a Latin term that means that I'm the parent of your child when you're not there. So I am the parent. And so you have to be able, that's why you have to get to know the teacher early on. Mm -hmm. You can't stay out of the school. You have to get to know your child's teacher. This child is with this teacher more, many hours, more hours than actually they're with you. Because if they have after school, if you work till six and seven o'clock, if they go from school to an after school, they don't see you until evening time. So you have to set clear boundaries of respect so that they'll know. So now when they come into the school, they're not gonna disrespect the teacher. Now, if there's something going on and a child comes to me and tell me, well, Miss Lopez um, t called me stupid. Okay, I, I have to now investigate. Okay, speak to the child. What happened? What was going on? I get some children from the class, a number, not all of them, about maybe five of them. I take them one at a time. As Michelle said, I talk to them. Did you hear what went on in the classroom during such a time? I get them to write it down if they can write. If not, if they're little, we scribe for them and they can't write. And then we get the teacher. It's a mediation meeting. We have to get the teacher in to find out what happened. You can't blow off the handle. You can't take the child's word but you do have to do something because you have to investigate. Just like you as a parent, when the child comes home and say, my teacher told me to sit my butt down and leave me alone, and I, and you, what, what did she say? She said what? And you get all hot-headed and you mad and you go up to the school, you ready to kick butt. No, my scripture, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding, Proverbs four and seven. You have to get understanding. You have to keep a cool head and say, what happened? Okay, I'm gonna go up and speak. And that's why you have to know the teacher. You have to know the principal. You have to know the AP. You have to know your school. You can't come in the office and say, I wanna speak to my child's teacher. And the principal comes to you and say, and you don't even know the principal because you haven't been up, you haven't met her. And you say, who are you? And you say, oh, I'm the principal. I'm Mrs. So-and-so. Oh, well, I need to speak to my child's teacher. Okay, mommy, what's your child's, um, what's your teacher's name? Um, I don't know. What class is the child in? I don't know. Get over here! What's your teacher's name? No. You need to know this information. You get a notebook and you keep a notebook that year, yearly, and write down everything. The school, the, the, you should know the superintendent's name, what district you're oh, in. Well, we're going to get the We're going to get all there. Okay. So, <laughs> so that's pretty much what we do. We talk to the child, we talk to children in the class, we talk to the teacher. I have to tell you, most of the time it's unsubstantiated because you can't get the story right. Unfortunately, we lie sometimes. Teachers sometimes tell fibs. And so I don't know what really happened. So I have to investigate and then I have to give her a warning or him a warning and say, listen, but you can't just take a child's word for it because you have to investigate. You have to keep a cool head. And then we find out, and if it's really something really egregious and it has to go further, we go further and further steps. But we do try to mediate because we want respect in the classroom. That's the only way learning is going to take place if there's respect. All right, thank you so much. Okay, can we hear from the teachers? Absolutely. Okay. So, I have, a little pet, I have a little pet peeve, parents. So, if your child has one of these and you're paying the bill and you don't know the, the password or whatever, I don't think I need to say anymore. You need to be running through your, in middle school. This thing right here creates so much confusion. This is like the destruction of this generation. Social media, these kids can, within an hour, have 500 people on a corner 
just from this device alone. I mean, they, can, they have these mobs where they just show up just, just from this device alone. You need to be checking. It's, there's no way you can be paying a, a cell phone bill and you're not checking your child's phone. You need to be checking your child's Facebook, their Instagram, all of this stuff. My, I mean, my, my niece, she's um, 16, and my brother, you know, he's a single parent raising a... And, I'm, and I tell him, I say, man, have you looked at your daughter's page? You have to be aware of what's going on. Because social media, unfortunately, it, it's good, but there's a, a side to it that it just creates so much confusion. There is no way. You have to be, give me your phone. And it's, if it's locked, I, I need the password. You, and you paying a bill. We have too many um, student-run households nowadays. You know, you have to know your child's password. And they know that you could be checking their phone at any any given moment, because this thing here creates so many problems. Trust me when I tell you, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Can you also talk a little bit about conflict between student and students as it relates to cyberbullying? And can you also explain what cyberbullying is? Well, cyberbullying is just like they'll go onto Facebook and they may say something about somebody. And I mean, this, this thing is so serious to the point where kids have literally committed suicide over um, being bullied over the, in, over the internet, through social media. It's just a real, real problem. That's why I, I just keep, I can't reiterate enough the importance of you checking your child's Facebook, your child's whatever they have, just to be aware because, you know, they go on, they go on here and they may say something and by the morning the whole school knows, knows about what, what someone has said about someone and it, it destroys, like I said, it's driven even kids to the point of suicide. So it, it's very, it's a very serious issue. Thank you so much. And um, Sister Pamela, do you have anything to mention in regards to conflict between student and student or student and parent? Um, I mean, well, student I, and teacher. I mainly, well, um, I, I think I'd like to focus more on the student and student because that's, that has a lot to do with how our day flows in the classroom because um, sometimes early in the morning, a child will come in angry. You know, we're ready to start the day, we're ready to start the literacy lesson, the reading lesson, whatever it is, we're ready to begin with the morning message and a child will come in late, maybe upset because of something that happened at home and um, their whole day is, has, been, has gone wrong. And then they may take it out on another child or the teacher, angry at the teacher for something we didn't, we didn't do to them. So I think it's important to talk to your children about you know, how to handle conflict and issues and problems that they have at home. Because a lot of students do not know how to solve conflict. They don't know how to solve problems. They come angry, they're ready to fight. As early as second grade, I've seen children not getting along. And I spent majority of my, there's sometimes when I've spent majority of my days dealing with conflict. Because children, they don't know how to talk to one another, man, teaching manners, respect, saying please and thank you. These things are taken away from our educational, our instructional time. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important for you as a parent or people, adults who are working with children to teach them how to get along. That's the key. How to, you know, say nice things to each other, like each other. You know, I, I don't understand what a second grade, a seven-year-old is so angry about early in the morning, at 8 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I, I don't understand this. So I have to try to solve I conflicts. I <laughs> You know what it is? Parents that, if I've seen it, young parents, sometimes grandparents that are raising their children, all types of dynamics go on um, in terms of family structure. And so you have this little seven-year-old who at home basically gets his or her away. And so they go to the corner store because they got to get snack or something to come in because she or she wants a snack. I, go, I used to go to the store and chase them out. And they say, what do you want? You don't give a child a chance. They don't, can't have autonomy at, at 8, 7.59, and school starts at 8 o'clock. That makes no sense. You cannot ask a child what they want when you're trying to crunch time. You already got them there late, and when they come in late, it bothers them. So I know you're going to talk about that too, a yeah. uh, time, okay? But it's important because when they come in late, and you heard Ms. Ledbetter say that the lesson has already begun, they've already started, and now they come in. It's embarrassing. And kids don't like to be embarrassed. 
And so the only way they know how to handle it is to get angry. And that causes conflict. So we as parents, our job is to make our child so we have to make them calm and calming, a calming spirit. And you don't be late, so you don't have to rush them. If you're late, then everything you're feeling, you put on your child. So now you're late, you made the child late, and now you're screaming and you're pulling them, hurry up, get ready, get your And then they're all frustrated and flustered. So you have to get things prepared at night. The clothes, put the books at the door, put the things that you oh, need. Oh, we're going to get there. Okay, wake up on time. <laughs> this is all a part of the conflict, because they come in with this anxiousness. They're upset, so now they take it out on Sean. And so now I'm doing a lesson and standing in front of them, and now they're upset, and Sean's book now is over here. And it Move over. Yeah. Get, get off my side of the table. Yeah, okay, so then that's the conflict. And then it goes on from there, and that interrupts the lesson. Okay, now. All right, thank you, so, Sister Benji. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about conflict. This is a question that probably either Sister Michelle can answer or Pamela. What do you do if there is a conflict initially with two students and then the parents get involved and they're not quite making the situation any better? Oh, no. <laughs> oh. When a parent gets involved, Lord, help us. Um, <laughs> because I've, I've had that happen um, more than one occasions where um, I have to sit in um, the principal, the dean, and myself have to sit in because there's two students who just can't get along. Like I said, you have to find the underlying problem between the two students, which means I need to come in and I need to talk to each one separately and then, if possible, have them speak together and try to come to a middle ground. Um, when parents get involved now, it's a bit touchy because they come up and they want to fight and they want to yell and they want to scream, which I think Sister Van may have to step in and answer that question. Yeah, um, yeah it happens. You just have to just let the parents know from the beginning that if you have a problem, if your child has a problem with another child, please, you cannot approach the other child. That's common sense. If you see a problem, there's a problem, please come into the school and speak to administration and let us handle it. But then you do have some that want to beat up the five-year-old because the five-year-old was hitting her five-year-old. And so, and then now you want to get the other parent, now the two parents want to fight. So if I've been in meetings where the parents almost leaped over the table and wanted to beat up the other parent and we had to get security and we had to separate the parents and put them in two different rooms. And um, my, my guidance counselor took the one parent and that child, and I took the other parent, and so that we could speak and calm them down. You just have to, you have to know that, and I know that I'm speaking to the choir here, because I know you guys, you never would behave this way in public or in school. Ah, yeah, 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 right? Never. So I know I'm speaking to the choir, but there are parents, I know it's hard for you to phantom, that they will come up to the school wanting to fight the children. The child that hit their child, the child that said something to their child. And you have to, sometimes I have to even call the police. You know, I, I, do, I do not like calling 911, but I have been known to call 911 if I have to. And so um, it's not a nice thing to do. Do not talk to other people's children if there's a conflict. You go into the building, you seek out administration, and you let the school handle it. If you want a meeting, you ask for a meeting, okay? But you don't solve it, because then you're going to be locked up. All right, thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to add that, you know, I know with parents, it's, you know, many parents suffer from the not my baby syndrome, you know, like, not, not my child, you know, and your child is your superstar, everybody's child is the star, and nobody and could do no wrong most of the time, you know what I mean? But you know your children. So, you know, and I, if I spend... 180 days with your child and I've seen all kinds of personalities and behaviors and acting out and then you come up and tell me my child would never do that but they live with you and I've seen it happen in these 180 days I've been with them who's I, I don't understand maybe um, maybe it's a different type of behavior that's happening in the classroom or uh, it could be the te you know they always say it could be the teacher it could be the environment there little there are a lot of 
factors that contribute to how students behave in school. It's not always the other child, it's not always the teacher, it's not always the school. Sometimes you just need to talk to your child and find out what's really going on. Okay. Thank you, Sister sure. Pamela. Um, this question is for you, Sean. How do, is there a situation in which maybe an electronic or a phone may be taken away by the teacher? Well, um, the policy is that the phones are not allowed to be during the day. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not supposed to have your phone out. So if we see a phone, then we are allowed to, to take it. They're basically, um, you know, the child should not be ha having their phones out during classroom, especially during instruction. You know, they're basically a child is to have a phone in case of an emergency. I think with the whole 9-11 thing that kind of made the policy, they, they've changed the policy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not that we, we can't take the phone, but if it, if it is out during or if, it's, if you hear, if it rings during classroom time, then you can take a phone. Most of the time we take it and we give it to the um, administrator and then the parent has to come in pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the importance. This is for Pamela and Sean, but anybody can jump in. Please discuss the importance of parental involvement in preparing for a successful school year. Um, I think that it's extremely important for parents to be involved because parents are like the cornerstone of the success of their students. And you, if, if a child is spending 180 days in school, that's, and, and 6.64 or more hours with a, a teacher, then you need to know them. You need to come up to the school, you need to visit, you need to email, you need to text if the teacher gives you their cell phone number. Um, they, we have this thing called um, Class Dojo, where we, it's an app that you can put on your phone and your iPad, and you can communicate with the teacher that way. You get notifications. Each child has an avatar, and you can, we can you know, click whether they're good, if they're performing well, if they're participating, if they're talking in class. There's so many ways to communicate now, so you don't have to... Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't know your teacher. I remember going to a mall one day and I saw one of my students and he ran over, Miss Lappin, Miss Lappin, and I was, said hello. And the, the parent looked at me like, who's this person you're talking to? I, I said, I'm your child's teacher. I met them in the mall. And that was like close to the end of the school year. I haven't seen the parent all year. And I don't think that should happen because if the, the teacher to me is like the second parent. And, you know, don't be discouraged if you may not always hear from the teacher, but it's important for you to reach out because, like me, I may have 30 kids in the class and it's just me. So I may not be able to reach every parent, but it's important for you to reach out, it's important for you to visit, it's important to talk about just the school day with the children so they can know, talk, describe, how, how do you like your teacher? You know, how is she treating you? How does she work with the other students? Are you learning anything? It's not just left up to the teacher. A lot of times parents say, well, I'll just drop my child off to school and that's it. The teacher, you have to know, you should develop a good rapport with your, with your child's teacher. They should become your best friend because they're with your child all day. And, um, you know, just reach out to them as much as possible. That's what I would say. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, this question is open to anybody. Can you discuss some of the resources that may be available in the schools? Um, and I mean, I know that's very broad. So if you want to talk about it in terms of like extracurricular activities and then somebody else can talk, maybe Michelle about like counseling, if the child is having like emotional issues mm -hmm. or if the child cannot talk to their parent, are there any other resources out there? And somebody can talk about um, preparing for SAT. Somebody else can talk about, you know, children that may have emotional disorders. So anybody can start. Well, I, I could just say first thing for as a parent, I think um, like parents can become a part of the school community. Parents are allowed to be members of school leadership teams mm -hmm. where they can even make even affect financial decisions. Like principals don't control their budgets by themselves. I mean, they may not, a lot of parents don't know this, but you're allowed to sit in on school leadership teams where you actually have a say-so in where um, certain how money is allocated for the school year. You need to become um, involved in like parent associations, so be, become involved with your PTA, whatever, and um, even with the, um, the school board. So, you know, it's like don't just send your child to school, become a part of the school community. 
you have to become, I mean, and you, I know a lot of parents, oh, I have to work, I have to work, but you have to find time for what's important. Mm -hmm. and, and you just have to find the time to do it. So I, I think that's a very important thing. I wanted to share, there's a website um, you can go to. It's called um, Engage New York. Mm -hmm. And you can get a lot of information about, for, about the school system, about the curriculum. Everything you need to know is on that website. And um, I think that you should really take advantage of that because that's an excellent tool to give you a lot of resources and information you need to know about what your child is learning. They also tell you what your child needs to know for each grade. By the end of each grade that they're in, you can get information about what they need to know by the end of what they should be learning and what they need to know by the end of the school year. So please, um, if you can, write it down. It's www.engagenewyork.org. Also, www.corestandards.org. That's where you can get the standards that we have your children are now set at higher standards, and you need to know the standards. Um, they're statewide. If you live in Virginia and you move here, or you live with whoever adopted the um, core standards, you should have the same education. That was the problem. We all had different standards over the nation, and that's why the scores were so low. That's why children were going to college and, and having to take remedial courses because they weren't getting the high quality education that they needed in Brownsville versus other areas. So we had to level the playing field, and that's what the core standards did for us. So you need to know the core standards. Everything is at your fingertips. Go to newyorkcity.gov, that's the DOE website. I mean, it's a wealth of information. You just click parent um, page and everything just opens up to you, you can know everything. Even if you're looking for a job and you, careers, if you wanna, is there, everything is on that website. So you really wanna take advantage of the resources. If you have a child, if you had a death in the family and a child knows about the death, you can get counseling. You go into the school, you speak to the principal, let them know. A lot of our parents, I'm, the school that I was in, I was in, um, and I started there in 1981, and it was Caribbean based. And Caribbean people, just like Americans, they're very private, very quiet. They don't want to tell you their business. Everything happens in the house, don't tell you anything. Kids come to school crazy, bonkers, we don't know why. Okay? <laughs> Somebody died last night, child in school today. Okay, we don't know why the child's bouncing off the walls. Okay, just had a death. Something horrible happened. Shooting in the neighborhood. Children come to school, they saw bodies in the industry. You don't know what's going on in a child's life. That's why I always tell the teachers, you have to give love. You have to be a nurturer. You don't know what our children are dealing with. They come to you, they need hugs. There was this wonderful clip that Melissa put on, on Facebook. Did everybody, anybody see it? Oh my God, it just left you in tears. A little boy went to school and he was narrating his, got on the bus, he said hi to the bus driver. The bus driver didn't say anything to him, just went like that. He went into the classroom, went into the building, the principal's at the door, come in, come in, come inside. Didn't say nothing. She said, hi, Mrs. So happy to see them. She just ushed, pushed them on. So we need to give our children love and warmth. The lunchroom lady shoved them off. I forgot, you didn't forgot your number, yelling at him and everything, no. Love them, love them. This is why we're in this profession. So use the resources at hand. You can get counseling. If your school's a Title I school and you can't afford uniforms, they have, we have money in our budget for tight, in Title I schools to buy uniforms for the child. I used to give uniforms to parents. If you can't afford to go um, send your child on a class trip, you have a hardship. Trips are part of the educational process. Never keep a child from a trip. They, they have to go out of the four walls. They need to get out of the neighborhoods. They need to go to the Museum of Natural History in Manhattan. They need to go to Philadelphia. They need to go. You come in, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. We have money for that. We can allocate money for children who can't afford to do these things, but you can't keep it quiet, and if you don't tell us, then we'll never know. So those are the resources that you have, and you should use them. If your child is dealing with um, issues, emotional, or oh, you well, think your child's not learning. I'm going to ask Sister Michelle. Um, this question is for you. Do you think that there should be more social, emotional education for children? Definitely. There definitely should be more social, emotional um, learning for children. Actually, there is a new program out um, right now. I cannot remember the name of it. 
but my school is supposed to be starting it up with the teachers and we're supposed to teach the teachers how to do socio-emotional activities with the students just maybe like at least 10 minutes a day so that either in the morning the afternoon whenever but sometime within that day we need the teachers to be engaged with the students so that the students can be engaged with each other on their social emotional behavior it's very important that um, the school environment is safe calm and a great learning environment once you have all those three in play, then it's smooth sailing. All right, thank you. Um, this question is either for Sean or Pamela. What do you do if you suspect that your child is a slow learner versus a child with disability? And what advice do you have for parents? What do I do if it's, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. The question is what do you do if you suspect that your child is a slow learner versus a child with a disability and what steps should you take as the parent? Well, it's important that you do know how your child learns because um, every child learns differently on different levels at a different pace. You know, some children are um, uh, tactile learners, some, um, le you know, some learn, some are visual learners and um, it's important that you understand how your child learns and then we can assess them and we can use strategies to help them move forward and develop and make progress in the best day, way that we can. But we try to get information from the parent on what we know, what you know initially about how they learn at home. What do you do with them at home to help them develop, to help them um, practice? And we, we give strategies, we, we try to provide strategies for parents to practice at home. Um, I think you need to know your child's reading level, and you can help them read based on a little help, help them choose books at home, to help them read and develop more at home. Yeah, I just want to add, like, parents are so, like, you have such a powerful voice, and I don't think parents, a lot of them realize it, but if you, for instance, have your child evaluated, and your child has specific needs, if you, if you need to stay on top of that school to make sure your children's needs are being met, I know of people who have their kids have a certain, they may have a certain individual education plan, and that particular school has not met their needs. And I know for a fact that these kids are, and the Department of Education is paying for them to go to some schools in paying, that schools cost $25,000 a year, and they are being paid for by the Department of Education. But a lot of people don't know this. You have to stay on top of it. If your children has a, education plan and it's not being met at their particular school and you can prove that uh, you can have your child uh, go into some of the finest private institutions and being paid for by the Department of Education. You have to be aware of these things. If you have a child in special ed and they have an IEP which is an individual educational plan it is updated annually and you have to sit in on the meeting and nothing happens until you sign off. And if you go in there by yourself and you don't understand the jargon, you don't understand, because it can be um, a bit tedious in terms of the paperwork they give you, you can ask for a parent advocate. And the district office will give you a parent advocate to go to the team meeting so that you can get a better understanding of what's going on with your child. And just like they said, stay on top of it and it will happen. This question is for you. It may have been answered before. Does it cause the, cause the education to go down when a child is pulled from a school and does the school lose its money? Yes, that's, we did touch on that when I talked about charter schools. When you, um, yeah, when you take children, they wait, yeah, exactly. Uh, after October, they always keep them, and after October, that's when anybody that comes in after that, we don't get any money for it. So you got to come in at the right time. So they pull them so they, before it so they can get the money. And so the money goes with the child. So if you leave before October, I don't have the money. Now the money goes to PS or whatever school and they get the money. And so now my budget dwindles because every child that's plucked, that money goes with that school, with that child. So this is why I said I am an advocate for community schools. I'm a community school supervisor. I went to a community school all my life. 
Um, I went to city colleges. I went to, um, I worked in a community school. So find a community school that's going to be right for you so that the money can stay where it's supposed to be um, so that we can do right by our children. Be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And can someone please explain the difference? I think even myself, I sometimes get confused between a charter school and a private school. I think we all generally know what public school is. Money. But what's the difference between private a charter Private school, you're paying money. Okay, you're going to pay money to go to the private school. Whatever the tuition is, that's what you're going to pay. That's why I tell people if you can find a school um, that's a good school, you could be saving money. There are wonderful community schools. Charter school is just like a public school, except that they don't get certain monies federally and state. They get, I think they get federal, part of federal, they get part of the state, and they don't have to have teachers that are in the union. So your teachers at the charter school are not unionized. And so sometimes teachers that, you know, unfortunately they're struggling with that test and they can't get licensed to be in a public school, community school, they'll go to charter school. And, and then they have longer hours than we do. And unfortunately, if a teacher, if you're not unionized, and you know what the union does for you, it does what? It protects you. So if you're not unionized, you don't have that protection in charter school. So that's the only difference is that they get, they get certain of um, federal and state money. You don't have to pay to go. Private school, you have to pay. So if you want, if you find a great private school and a great charter school, um, and your community school, you don't like it for whatever reason, <laughs> you're gonna go to where? You're gonna go to charter school because you don't have to pay. So that's the main, it's the money. All right, thank you so much. Um, now I have another question. What do you do when a teacher is rude to your child and your child now shuts down as far as participating in the class? You have to. No, this could let it probably be for one of the okay, teachers. Yes, the question, we, 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 the question is, what do you do when a teacher is rude to your child and now the child shuts down from participating do in the class? The what does the parent do? Oh. Oh. Um, well, I think the parent, like I said before, should be in constant communication with the teacher because if you know your teacher and you know your child, you can kind of make a decision based on, you know, would Miss Ledbetter do that? Would my child do that? You know, you want to get information. You want to ask questions. You want to meet with them, make an appointment, and find out what's going on. Because, um, you know, all children are not innocent, and all teachers are not innocent. And sometimes, you know, children may have provoked the behavior. And it's, I'm not saying it's okay to be rude to anybody's child. You know, we want to embrace and love everybody's children. But you have some children who are disrespectful and they and 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 for no reason it could be for no reason at all and not that we should we shouldn't respond how a child responds but you want to question your child and be sure um, get get the facts before you go up and approach the teacher and the principal and try to get the teacher in trouble and say it's not my child not my child you want to get the facts and try to resolve it as peacefully as possible because like I said the child is with the teacher for hours probably more than you may spend during a school year because you're always at work and then they're with the teacher, then they go to after school, and then by the time you get home, sometimes they're asleep, <laughs> you know, or they're with another adult. So I think it's important that you get the facts, do not jump to any conclusions, and um, just know your child and, and, and know the teacher. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, I will just, just add that, like, like she said, it's just very important to have a relationship with your child and to really know your child's um, teacher. I think, like, I always tell a lot of teachers, like, you can't really take things personal because, like you say, you never know what a child is going through. And I'll be the first to say it. I'll put it out there. Not all teachers need to be teaching. I mean, it's, it's just the bottom line. It's just, it is what it is. There are some teachers who do not need to be teaching. All right, thank you. So now we're going to move more into preparing for the actual school year. And our first question is for you, Sean. How do you help prepare your child from a transition? This one is specifically from elementary to middle school. So, um, I'm sorry, repeat the question. 
So the question basically is like what strategies or what tips do you have for parents as their children are going to be making transition from like elementary to middle school? Oh, okay, so um, the school that I actually taught at was a gifted and talented school. So the it was a middle school that basically almost <laughs> ran like um, uh, high school or college. I mean, kids, the, the, the demands and the rigor was very tough. So we try and really instill in kids a lot of um, time management because the jump from elementary to middle was so severe. I mean, these kids literally coming into the sixth grade where reports had to be typed. I mean, they may have like four or five reports. I see Rebecca back there shaking her head. <laughs> four or five reports that had to be I mean, you get a pro they had a project doing math, English, social studies, science, where every month, and these things, we, we required them to be typed. Like, so we taught them early on. Um, each child was required to um, purchase an organizer, a planner, that they had to write the dates down, when things were due. So we really instilled in them you know, the, the importance of just time management and just staying on top of them. Um, Cause that, that is, the, the jump is very, it's very severe. I want to add to that um, response. Um, to transition from elementary to middle school, it's very important for fourth grade parents to stay on top of your children. Because when they're, when they're ready to transition to middle school, middle schools do not look at fifth grade grades. Because we can't. Mm -hmm. They can't. There's nothing to look at because they're, they're now entering fifth grade and now they're preparing for middle school. Now you have to pick a middle school. So what middle schools look at is fourth grade. So fourth grade is a very critical year that you need to stay on top of your children. You need to stay on top of them academic-wise and you need to stay on top of their attendance. Attendance is very, mm -hmm. very very, very important. I cannot stress how important it is. It's very important. If your child does not come to school, they are losing ed, um, instructional time. They're falling behind. So every day that that child is not in school, they're losing out on their education. Mm -hmm. um, another grade that is very critical is seventh, seventh grade. grade. Fourth and seventh. Okay? Because going into high school, you can't look at eighth grade grades because they are now entering eighth grade. So high school is going to look at seventh grade grades. Okay? So please, parents, keep that in mind. Fourth and seventh grade is very important. And 11th grade, as they they'll go. be yeah, preparing yeah. for college, yeah. right? Four, uh, seven, and 11. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you talk a little bit uh, about preparing for college? Talking about like SATs, ACTs, funding for colleges, and things of that sort. That's open to anybody. Well, you know that when, they pre when they're preparing, you can go... There are so many things online that they can do essays and they can get different types of monies that will help them. But they have to put the work in. By then, they're older. They really have to do it. They have to do the work. Guidance counselor. In high school, make sure they know how many credits they have. That they up on how many. They, they have to know how many credits they need to graduate. So you want to get that early on. You want to make sure that their credits are stable. You want to make sure that you're going to the guidance counselor in your high school. That your child is now, when it's time to apply for colleges, they're applying for colleges in a timely manner. You're not waiting the last minute. They're taking the SATs. They even have, you can take, um, I think, the you can, the pre-SATs, though, they can practice for it. You want to take advantage of every opportunity for them to do it. Don't, don't wait till the last minute. And you want to keep on top of everything they're doing in high school. So that's what I know just from that level. Anyone else want to add? I just want to add that, you know, um, one of the reasons for the Common Core Standards is to help children to be college and career ready. Mm -hmm. And they start in as early as pre-K, kindergarten. So I think that, you know, you have to encourage your children as early as elementary school to practice good habits, mm -hmm. study habits, um, you know, that hone in on how they learn, um, get them a tutor, invest in their education, save the money for the video games and all that other stuff. 
and invest in their education, find the best tutor, find the best after school programs. We don't, you don't just want to send them somewhere to someone who's available and who's willing to babysit. But if you start early, they'll have those, those study and practice habits. Let them learn. Let their life be a learning experience. You know, over the summer, many of them probably, I'm, you know, I don't know what you did with your children, but it's important that you take them to museums and expose them to real life experiences so they can make self-detect connections in school. Because a lot of what they're learning about in our communities, they may not have be as exposed or have a better understanding of what they're learning about in their textbooks. So you want to start them early, as early as pre-K, or as soon as they come out the womb, start reading to them or something, you know, because they need to develop good habits all along their educational experience. Yeah. I just want to add also that you need to be aware of just like programs, like there are, I know everyone can't afford Sylvan and Kaplan, these people want you to take practically second mortgages out on your homes just to study for a test. Yeah. And there are free programs, like I know in this, um, in, they have a specialized high school um, program that prepares students to take the specialized high school exam. That program has just as much a success rate and it's free as people who are going to Sylvan and Kaplan. So you just have to do your research and, stay, and you know, stay on top of guidance counsel and find out what's out there. Just be very at, relentless with it and just do your research. Anything else you would like to say, Sister VNG, about strategies for a successful school year? Just a lot have been said. Just um, please making certain that the children are reading, that they have to read, that I know that everything is digital now, but get a library card. The library is still brick and mortar. It's still there, and it's in your neighborhood. And it's free. And, it's free. <laughs> and um, you really need to get them, get them a library card. Go to the library, make it a daily, not even a daily, but maybe twice a week. Go in there with them. Let them, you know, re writing, because it goes hand in hand. When they're reading, let them write about it and talk about it. You get that communication going. Um, vocabulary is very big. You know, you want to get your thesauruses now and start teaching them synonyms. And w don't just say, I like this. I like this. I like this. What's another word for like? You know, you want to start building their vocabulary because that's what these exams are all about also is a lot of vocabulary and things that they're not used to, they haven't heard because they don't have that, you know, that background. We have to build so much background, build it at home. You are their first teachers. We are, we are their first teachers. And so that's what we have to know. Um, those study habits, get it in early. Start a routine. You know, school's getting ready to start next Thursday. I know everybody got sad. School's getting ready to start next Thursday. You know, start setting those routines up for the little ones. Build the bag at night. What goes in the bag? The homework. The things that suppose you're supposed to sign off on. We didn't get to this, but I have to throw it out there. Your lunch application, as soon as you get it, please fill it out. It's money. If you don't fill it out, the school loses money. Every child, if you say, my child don't eat the lunch. Fill it out anyway. Fill it out anyway. We need 100%. So everything that comes home, do little things, routines at night so you don't have to rush. Make sure they're doing some math. Take them to the museums. Get some history in. Let them listen to the clean part of the news if you can find it. Um, world news tonight. Know what's going on in the world. The weather. You know, so they can know how to dress. You can know how to dress. And you won't have them outside, you know, with a coat in the summer and no coat when it's... I've seen it all, you know. My mother didn't know it was going to rain. My mother didn't know that it was going to be cold. So they sent them in a little sweater when they should have had a jacket on. These things you do with your children, dinner time. I know we don't sit at the table anymore like we used to back in our day, but still make it fun and have conversation. Please converse with your children, talk to them. It's no longer children should be seen and not heard. That's how we were raised. Children should be seen and not heard. No, let them talk to you so they don't want to get out. They don't want me talking crazy stuff. All right, thank you, everybody, for this panel discussion. I just want to make, um, somebody made this uh, suggestion that there's an Overdrive app in which people can read digital books from your local library. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say, when I was uh, um, going from high school to college, I was always on, I think it was Fast Web, but I was able to get a lot of scholarships that actually covered my first two years of college. So definitely, a lot of them is that you have to write essays, mm -hmm. 
But I mean, any one of the educators up here can probably help you look at your essay, a counselor at your school, or myself, I'm available, just so that we, we know that there's resources out there that we don't have to get broke while trying to get a college degree. So thank you, everybody, especially our panelists. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah.